Winter is almost here, and for us, it's our very first with a heat pump. It's performed brilliantly so far, heating our hot water, taking us from spending around £1.7 pence to around 33 pence for a tank of hot water each day, compared to using gas. That's a massive 74p saving each day. And that's not including getting rid of the gas standing charge either. But now comes the real test. How will it perform over winter to heat at home? If you've just had a heat pump installed or you're thinking about it, this video will walk you through some ways we're preparing our home and heating system for the winter. I'll cover everything, including my heating schedule in relation to my electricity tariff, understanding and adjusting the heat curve, how to minimize your biggest source of heat loss, and balance your radiators using the lock shields with a thermal camera like this one from Hick Micro. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the channel, my name's Shan. If you watched my recent video, you'll know that we replaced our 26-year-old Potterton Suprema 70 non-condensing boiler with a Valent Aerotherm Plus 7 kW heat pump in July this year, which was put in by our Heat Geek approved local installer, Green Home Heating. Having a plan for our first winter with a heat pump will help us get the most out of our new heating system and help us understand how to get it to its best efficiency and reduce our energy bills. Let's start with the brains of our heating system. Valence Sensor Comfort Device is a thermostat and control interface designed to manage our heating and hot water efficiently. It also integrates weather compensation by using an outdoor sensor placed on a shady north-facing aspect of our house to automatically adjust the heat pump's flow temperature based on outside conditions, optimizing our comfort and energy use. And this leads me nicely onto something you may have heard of, the heat curve. This isn't just a fancy setting. It's a smart system that automatically adjusts how hot the water flowing to your radiators or underfloor heating is, based on the outdoor temperature. Genius, right? Our heat curve is currently set at 0.6. What that means is when it's colder outside, the flow temperature from the heat pump to the radiators increases to keep the house warm. In early autumn, 0.6 has been absolutely fine. But as it starts to get colder, we may need to nudge this up to 0.7 or 0.8 if needed, to make sure the rooms don't get chilly. Adjusting the heat curve is about finding the sweet spot between comfort and efficiency. A higher heat curve increases the water temperature more steeply as it gets colder outside, making the radiators heat up faster and provide more heat quickly. The trade-off is that this also uses more energy and can reduce efficiency. The best way to adjust this is to monitor your room temperatures and comfort levels and then tweak the curve slightly until you feel comfortable without seeing a big jump in your electricity consumption. After making a change to your heat curve, it's best to reassess your heating system's performance and comfort over one to two weeks. This time frame allows enough days with varying outdoor temperatures to observe how the new curve affects indoor warmth and energy use. If after a week you find your rooms are still too cold, you can increase the curve slightly. If overheating or excessive energy use occurs, reduce it a bit. Small incremental adjustments, followed by a period of observation, help you find the ideal balance between comfort and efficiency without causing abrupt energy spikes. It's important to ditch the old habit of turning off your heating when you leave or go to bed. With low flow temperature systems, it's far more efficient to use a setback temperature just 2-4 to four degrees lower than your comfort setting, which keeps your home's thermal mass fed and prevents the system from having to work extra hard and less efficiently to recover from a big temperature drop. Think of it like keeping a car at a steady speed, instead of constantly braking and accelerating. But I'm a homeowner, rather than an installer, so achieving the lowest running costs rather than achieving the highest efficiency is the most important thing to me. As such, I'll show you how I've set my heating schedule up to match my time of use tariff. Not as a one size fits all, but rather so I can show you my rationale and thinking behind it, and how you can think about your own heating schedule. By the way, if you're finding this useful, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for free. Doing so really does help keep me motivated to make future videos just like this one, so you can learn from our triumphs and regrets on our heat pump journey. My electricity tariff is currently with E.ON on their next drive fixed V7 tariff, which gives me 7 hours of off-peak electricity from midnight to 7am at 6.7p per kilowatt hour and 27.45p per kilowatt hour at all other times fixed till April next year. We have an electric vehicle in the form of our Nissan LEAF and so can access this off-peak slot to charge our EV, home battery and whatever else we choose. We also heat our hot water via the heat pump during this time too. You can see for the month of September the heat pump used 98.5 kilo hours 
to heat our hot water, all in the off-peak period with a COP of 4.02. That's £6.60 for 31 days for 300 litres of hot water, compared to £1.07 it would have cost us using gas each day. So what does our heating schedule look like? Starting at midnight till 3am, when we're all usually asleep, the temperature drops back to 19 degrees, and the hot water is scheduled to come on for a few hours to heat it to 50 degrees. It does a one-off Legionella cycle to 70 degrees on a Saturday, again in the off-peak period. If 70 degrees sounds obscenely high, it is, but unfortunately this temperature cannot be changed in the settings. We can however schedule it for the weekend, as that's when the boys have their football games, and it's actually pretty useful to have plenty of hot water to get around. 3am to 7am, when the off-peak period ends, we have the house set to 21.5 degrees to get it up to a nice temperature to wake up to and to get out of the shower to. Once the off-peak electricity ends, we drop it back slightly to between 20 and 20.5 degrees up until 4pm. We typically start making dinner around 4pm with our young family. Since upgrading to an induction hob that replaced our gas hob when we got a heat pump, we're even more likely to exceed the battery in versus 3 kilowatt output especially when using other appliances like the oven at the same time and in winter when there is little solar kicking around. So reducing the heat pump's desired temperature at the same time we're using those appliances should reduce the need for us to use expensive peak rate electricity. But because the heating will be running almost continuously during a 24 hour period, the thermal mass of our house will have built up heat and therefore will be able to hold its temperature comfortably during those couple of hours or we'll get dinner ready meaning we're less likely to draw expensive peak rate electricity. Once dinner's done, the temperature is set slightly higher to ensure a comfortable room temperature as our kids start getting ready for bed. Like most homeowners, the bottom line for me is the cost of heating my home and hot water, rather than just the efficiency, cop or scop. Of course, this is just how we've set ours up, and it seems to be working well. It's been a reasonably mild September here in the northeast of England, but we've had some temperatures down to 4 degrees overnight. We've spent around £7.73 for heating since the 11th of September when we caved in and turned our heating on. But I suspect that figure is actually lower than this. Whilst I've installed a Shelly energy monitor, it's quite tricky to get the data of what source the heat pump is consuming its electricity from. So whether it's using electricity from the battery, solar generation or from the grid. Given that I've not run out of electricity from the battery on the night time before the next off-peak period kicks in yet, I've taken a 50-50 split of the 6.7p off-peak import rate and 16.5p export rate I'd be losing by the heat pump using the battery being topped up with the solar electricity I would have otherwise been exporting. This gives me an average price per kilowatt hour of running the heat pump outside the off-peak slot of 11.6p per kilowatt hour. Obviously, as we get into winter, and run out of stored off-peak electricity in the battery with less solar kicking around in the day, this average price per kilowatt hour will go up. So, coupled with the £6.60 for hot water heating, that's £14.33 it's cost us in total for heating and hot water in September. Compare this to the same period last year when it used 592.1 kilowatt hours of gas, it would have cost me £37.24 based on the current price of gas at 6.29 pence per kilowatt hour. That's a saving of 22 pounds and 91 pence, and it doesn't even include getting rid of the daily standing charge for gas. At the time of making this video, the Eon Next Drive tariff I'm on has since changed to a version 10, and the off-peak rate has changed to 7.5p per kilowatt hour for six hours, and you'll now need an EV to get onto this tariff. That said, it's still an excellent tariff, especially when combined with their export rate of 16.5p per kilowatt hour. And crucially, both these import and export rates are fixed for 12 months. So no nasty price rises mid-tariff. If it's a perfect fit for you and you plan to sign up to the EON Next Drive tariff, consider using the referral link in the video description box below to bag both you and the channel a £50 voucher. Thanks in advance if you do use the channel's referral link, it really does help keep the channel going. Of course, there's no point in your heat pump working brilliantly to heat your home, but all that heat escaping. A home's roof is one of the biggest contributors of heat loss if not properly insulated. Over the summer we had a few ethernet cables routed to all the bedrooms and the study downstairs from the loft and it's no surprise then that there may be a few gaps where the insulation was moved to get the cables down into the walls. Luckily it's easier than ever now to check for gaps and cold spots in your loft insulation 
using a thermal camera like this D01 from Hig Micro. The D01 is the most affordable smart thermal imager in the world. Designed for homeowners, anyone can use it with its smart scene recognition and user-friendly design. Here's how to do it. Make sure the heating has been on for a while. It's generally recommended that there's at least a 10 degrees Celsius difference between the inside and outside temperatures for meaningful thermal imaging results. This temperature differential helps highlight heat loss areas and cold spots clearly on the thermal image, making it easier to spot gaps or inadequacies in the insulation. Enable Super Scene Mode. This AI-driven mode enhances the thermal image, making it easier to spot cold spots drafts, and missing insulation, highlighting areas where heat may be escaping. Next, scan the loft area slowly, and around any known areas of weakness, like around cables, pipes, and loft hatches. Once identified, these gaps can be corrected by adding insulation or sealing with draft-proofing materials to improve overall energy efficiency and comfort. Using a thermal camera takes the guesswork out of insulation checks and helps you target improvements precisely where they're needed. I've dropped a link to this Hick Micro D01 thermal camera in the video description box below so you can check it out for yourself. Now let's talk about thermostatic radiator valves or TRVs. A lot of people wonder if they should turn these down to save energy, but with heat pumps the advice is a bit different compared to traditional boilers. It's best to leave your TRVs fully open in all rooms, especially your main living areas. This is because heat pumps operate most efficiently when they can run steadily, delivering low temperature heat consistently throughout your home. If you restrict flow by turning the TRVs down too much, it causes the heat pump to cycle on and off more frequently, which can reduce efficiency and wear the system unnecessarily. If you find your home feels too warm with all your TRVs open, instead of throttling individual radiators, it's better to adjust the heat curve temperature on your heat pump controller or app. When radiators aren't balanced, some fill with hot water quicker and get hotter while others take longer and stay cooler. This can make certain rooms uncomfortable and force your heat pump to work harder. So how do you balance your radiators? You adjust the lock shield valve, usually found on the opposite side of the thermostatic radiator valve. This valve controls how much water flows out of each radiator. And we can use the Hick Micro D01 again here. Start by turning your heating off and letting your radiators cool completely, making sure your TRVs are fully open on every radiator. This gives you a blank slate for your adjustments. Next, turn your heating back on and let it run. As the radiators start to heat up, use your thermal camera to watch the temperature spread. You'll notice some radiators get hot quickly. These need to slow down. The D01 makes this easy with its super IR resolution of 57,600 pixels and auto tracking hot, cold and sense spots displaying their corresponding values. On radiators heating up slower, often further from the heat pump, keep the lock shield more open. Start with a quarter turn at a time. On radiators that heat up too quickly, usually those closest to the heat pump, gradually close the lock shield valve. Wait around 10 to 15 minutes after each adjustment, then scan again with your thermal camera. Your goal here is for all the radiators to warm up roughly at the same rate, with similar surface temperatures along the top bar, where the thermal camera shows an even color or temperature profile. Work your way around your house, repeating small adjustments and giving the system time to settle. Balance radiators not only improve your home's comfort, but help your heat pump run efficiently by distributing heat evenly and reducing short cycling or overworking. So my final thoughts as we head into winter. Having a carefully planned heating schedule and understanding your heat pump's controls, especially the heat curve, can make a huge difference in comfort and running costs. It's not just about setting and forgetting though. Monitor, tweak, and balance your system for efficiency and warmth. Using a thermal camera to assess your home's insulation and radiator balance removes the guesswork. It's an affordable and smart way to spot heat loss and inefficient radiator flow, ensuring your system runs as smoothly as possible. Remember to leave your TRVs fully open for steady, efficient heat pump operation. And if rooms feel too warm, adjust your heat curve instead of shutting radiators off. This helps your system run efficiently without unnecessary strain, saving energy and money. So where are you on your heat pump journey? Have you embraced the technology fully or are you skeptical it will work for your home? Maybe you've had a frustrating install or unexpected builds. Drop a comment below and let's get the conversation going. Your experience may well just help someone else. 
I'll keep posting to the channel with lots more tips, real world updates and costs with our heat pump over winter. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you in the next one.